that there is a huge amount of compassion within the sector. And I think that's you know the reason that many of us get into this line of work. And, I, you know, I've met some deeply incredible, inspiring people who, despite all the system problems, have, you know, provided excellent care. And also people get better, like outcomes from drug and alcohol, harmful use and dependence are quite good if you have, um, you know, if you are able to access treatment and support. You are listening to a Morsley Learning Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Maudsley Learning Podcast. I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Emma Roberts, who is an addiction psychiatrist and research fellow working in South London, currently doing work with people with addiction to substances as well as addictive behaviours. He conducts research looking at the impact of policy change on patients as well as their ability to access healthcare services. Dr. Roberts was the clinical lead for the Homeless Hotel Drug and Alcohol Service in London, uh, which started during the pandemic and the first such service in London. And he's recently been awarded some fellowships to develop interventions to improve care for people with drug use and researching health policy. So big congratulations in order. Dr. Roberts, it's a huge pleasure to have you with us here today. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So I guess to start with, you know, on, on, on the note of funding, which is very exciting for, for <laughs> anyone who works in health research, what are the kind of things that you're working on at the moment or what are the kind of things that you're hoping to work on? Yeah, both very exciting and also very relieving that I'm, uh, I'm going to have a job for, for the next few years. But yeah, the, there's two sort of parts to what I'm going to be doing over the next four or five years or so. The, the first is a year based in the US, um, so based in Stanford in California, trying to understand a little bit more about the opioid epidemic and the opioid crisis there. Um, obviously, there's been lots of work conducted on that, but doing more of a comparative look um, between the UK and the US. So I'm going to be focusing specifically on opioid overdose outcomes in LGBT minoritized populations and how those are similar or different between the US and the UK and what lessons we might be able to learn about targeting opioid overdose prevention outcomes specifically within that population. Uh, and then f- following on from that, I'm, I'm coming back to SLAM. So um, uh, <laughs> you're stuck with me for another five years after then. That's an NIHR fellowship, which is looking to understand a little bit more about people who repeatedly go to hospital uh, and have bad hospital outcomes for who, who have addiction disorders, so who have problems primarily with alcohol or drugs. Yeah, so why they go to hospital, why they're going frequently uh, and what interventions can we perhaps put in place for those people who are already accessing drug and alcohol services to try and reduce um, uh, unnecessary hospital admissions. What are your feelings on the differences between the opiate problems in, in the US versus the UK? Because I guess we TV shows, kind of news, we hear a lot about the US, but less, I think, about the UK. Yeah, I think everyone's probably been watching Dope Sick and reading Empire of Pain and, and various things over the last few months, which is great. And, you know, I'd, I'd really recommend them. I suppose, you know, the, the things to, to not forget um, for our, the UK audience is that, you know, Scotland has the highest drug related deaths per capita in Europe, and it has done for the last four or five years. And last year, in the, for the 2020 figures, you know, we have the highest drug related deaths on record ever captured in the United Kingdom. So, you know, we, we have our own opioid epidemic. The, the reasons behind it and the, the levers of treatment are, are, are different in some ways to the US, but we still have a huge drug related death problem and uh, i suppose even more sort of in a cinderella way you know uh, our alcohol related deaths um uh, were also the highest on record over the last year and so alcohol often gets sort of a little bit forgotten when we start talking about drug related deaths so i think it's important for people to know that you know addiction problems at the moment in the uk are about as bad as they've ever been and that's again due to a whole variety of reasons and and things that have happened to, to addiction services over the past 10 to 15 years that perhaps we can talk a little bit about. But yeah, we, we have our own opioid crisis in the UK. Uh, its origins are, are slightly different. Our cohorts are slightly different, but we can learn things the way that the US is, it has dealt with their problems um, uh, and vice versa. Do you have a feeling for what kind of, kind of exchange of knowledge you, you're hoping to, to work on or, or to find? Yeah, I mean, I guess a big thing in the US is that the, the, their access to opioid substitution treatment is a lot poorer than it is here in the UK. So they have, some states have only one opioid substitution clinic available throughout their patch, which is obviously enormous. And so we might complain some about and people getting opioid replacement therapy here, but it's, it's significantly worse in the US in some, in some areas. 
that being said, they are doing lots of innovative things in terms of increasing access to a variety of interventions in, in, in the US. And there's also really exciting things happening in the UK. So there's development of um, two of the medicines that we use to treat heroin dependence, uh, buprenorphine and methadone are the two most commonly um, used. There's a new formulation of buprenorphine of, available that's, that's becoming more and more widely used over the past sort of six months to a couple of years, um, which is an injectable version of, of buprenorphine. So it it lasts longer um, in people's systems and is is one of the real new modern advances that uh, is happening in out in addiction treatment and is working very very well for some patients. So there are a number of trials and a number of pilot projects happening um, across the world, but but also uh, within the UK at the moment to try and expand provision of what we call depo or injectable buprenorphine. That's really cool. I I hadn't heard about uh, about that as an option, which sounds amazing. I guess for convenience. Yeah, it means so. I mean, t- t- traditionally, you know. Patients with heroin dependence would, would have to, when they start on these medicines, have to go to a pharmacy on a daily basis to collect their medication and be observed taking it. The, the, the injectable version obviously removes that need or necessity to, to turn up every day. And we obviously know that people with heroin dependence have or can have the other difficulties in their life that might, lives that might prevent them from doing those kind of things or, you know, prescriptions get lost, people can't make it to the pharmacy, timings happen, you know, life gets in the way. And so having an injectable version for some individuals might be, might be much better. I think it's really about increasing patient choice. So being able to offer people the best evidence of these medications um, and other treatments that we can in addiction. And so, yeah, expanding the sort of repertoire in terms of what we're able to provide is, is always a good thing when you described kind of people going to a pharmacy every day to collect something, be observed, taking it, the, the thought that flashes through my head is about stigma as well. I wonder if patients may feel less stigmatised with an injectable or or actually if that's not yet clear. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's lots of qualitative work that's being done at the moment to try and understand users' experiences of, uh, you know, of uh, having injectable medicines. And, and you're completely right. The one thing that I think we sort of probably expect is that it's, you know, it's much more discreet to come in once every week to, to, to get your methadone or your buprenorphine. That being said, some people might prefer the other options. Going and having an interaction with someone on a daily basis to pick up your um, to pick up your medicines can be very positive. And obviously pharmacies can also provide a lot of other health care, in particular for people who are heroin dependent and thinking about needle and exchange programs. Um, so picking up clean needles, but also accessing tests for a variety of other things, most recently COVID vaccines and you know a whole variety of other things. So, I mean, I think oral medication is not going to go away on the basis of this. But like I say, being able to increase patient choice and being able to increase our sort of innovation in terms of the interventions that we deliver to ultimately reduce or um, get people abstinent from using heroin, it, it can only be a good thing. One question that I've wondered about what you what your feelings are or what what the evidence might say is on the topic of drug consumption rooms it's a uh, it's a political hot potato it's probably the easiest way of describing it so for those listeners who might not know drug consumption rooms they also go by a variety of other names so overdose prevention centers supervised injection facilities you know a, a whole variety of of nomenclature out there are safe spaces typically staffed with healthcare professionals uh, in which users drug users can come and safely consume their, their drug of choice, typically heroin or opioids, but it can be other drugs. And there's trained professionals on site to deal with overdoses, to reverse overdoses, and also they can provide clean and safe equipment for people to use. So the evidence on them, uh, so about 16 countries, I think, although don't quote me on that, it's around that, um, have drug consumption rooms. Uh, or, or the equivalents thereof. One, the most recent example is one's just opened in the United States, and the observational evidence for them is is very strong. So there has never been an overdose that hasn't been reversed in a drug consumption rooms. There's been no fatalities on site, and typically they are very useful in terms of they increase public immunity. They have been shown to observationally reduce drug related crime and reduce drug related paraphernalia around. The two big objections are always that, well, there's no randomized control evidence that, that they work. You're never going to be able to do a randomized control trial on a drug consumption room. It's, it's, it's not feasible. It's not ethical. And the, the barriers in the UK are, are, are surround legal issues around the Misuse of Drugs Act, which in various readings or interpretations would uh, trying to use my language carefully, but would, would, would block access to, to starting or, or having a legal drug consumption room. So, I mean, the Misuse and Drugs recommended um, trials or pilots of drug consumption rooms a number of years 
years ago, organisations have come out in favour of advocating to the government that in the UK we should open a, uh, or we should pilot um, a drug consumption room. So they include the Royal College of Psychiatrists, the Faculties of Public Health, um, you know, most major medical bodies. So I'm absolutely in favour of drug consumption rooms in the UK. I think it would be a very useful part of our arsenal in dealing with our enormous drug-related death problem. That being said, they are not a magic bullet uh, and drug consumption rooms alone are not going to be the thing that fixes the, the, the drug and alcohol treatment system in the UK, but they would form part of a very useful arsenal, I think. Mm, okay. And you said that the issues with drug and alcohol in the UK at the moment are, are at some of the highest levels that they've been. The highest levels. <laughs> the highest levels. Highest re- ever recorded levels, yeah. Ever. Which is, I mean, awful in terms of the the suffering and the the difficulties that that must bring people what i guess what are your thoughts on on the issues at the moment yeah so i mean if if you talk to most people in the who work in drug and alcohol treatment services there's a lot of burnout workforces it is very very difficult people have very high caseloads and and part of the problem has come from a significant reduction in funding over the last 10 or so years so yeah, just to give people a bit of an idea as to the drug and alcohol treatment landscape in, in England, prior to 2012, the majority of services were run by the NHS. Subsequent to 2012 and the implementation of the Health and Social Care Act, drug and alcohol treatment services, the responsibility for them was devolved to local authorities. And that meant that the money going towards drug and alcohol services was part of the public health grant and individual local authorities could choose how to spend that money as they wished on a variety of services, drug and alcohol being one particular part of that. And what it has resulted in over the last 10 years is a about a £250 million pound reduction overall in the in disinvestment from drug and alcohol services, which has obviously had huge amounts of knock-on problems in terms of staffing, in terms of outcomes, in terms of morale, in terms of ability to train addiction psychiatrists, but also nurses, psychologists, recovery workers. And so the sector's been really, really struggling. What has happened in the last with it over the last year is that we've had a, a landmark review published by Dame Carol Black, the Independent Review of Drugs, made a number of recommendations around drug and alcohol treatment, one of the keystones of which was, uh, was a restoration or indeed an increase in funding in the entire sector. For the back of that, we had the new drug strategy published around about six months ago, which promised to basically reverse the disinvestment and has a staggered sort of amount of funding that's going to be increased to the sector over the next three to five years. And whilst that's obviously very, very welcome and, and, and absolutely what the sector needs, it, you know, it, you can't undo the damage of the last 10 years over the course of a short amount of time and with a return to funding levels that as they were 10 years ago. So that, you know, it, it's going to take some time with to build up workforce, to build up resilience, to build up innovation across the sector. And hopefully, you know, we can start turning around a disastrous trend of outcomes over the last 10 to 15 years, but it's going to take time. And I think it's going to take a huge amount of work across the sector, but it's, it's, it's a very positive first step. And I don't want to sound too negative. You know, the, the new drug strategy has some good stuff in it, some bad stuff in it. I'm very, very welcome to the return of adequately funding a sector that's been in desperate need and decimated over the last 15 years. Mm. Would, would your vision be for drug and alcohol services to be provided within the NHS, like other mental health services, or are there benefits to the current system that you would want to see continued? I think that's a really interesting question, and I don't think there's a simple answer to to that. And I think that too often within drug and alcohol work, the the world of, of addiction, we end up having these really sort of forced, unhelpful dichotomies. So you know, things should be entirely NHS funded or, uh, sorry, entirely NHS provided or entirely third sector or voluntary sector provided or people should entirely become abstinent or people should only focus on reducing harms from substances that they take. And, and, and I think, yeah, too often we get sort of pigeonholed into these very binary decisions, none of which, you know, there's no binaries in medicine as far as I'm concerned. And so, yeah, I think, you know, the third sector has done some really interesting and innovative work over the last 10 years in England. It's obviously done that at a time when the system has been completely, re- well, has completely changed and also has been hugely disinvested in. That being said, you know, I'm an NHS psychiatrist. I work with NHS systems. I find it insane that we all work on different electronic 
record systems. It's very difficult to access patients' drug and alcohol information compared to other parts of their healthcare. There's obviously way, you know, splitting up in terms of lots of different treatment providers reduces integration when the whole idea is that you would produce, you know, everyone's always talking about integrated health systems, you know, integrated health systems for both physical care, mental health care, and substance misuse. And if we're devolving things to local authorities and devolving things to other providers, that often has the impact of reducing, not improving integration. And so I think there are problems around that and it can create barriers for some people in terms of accessing different services and and ensuring that they can access services. And those barriers are really important, actually, particularly for people who have, who can have very chaotic lives and struggle to access healthcare and, and drug and alcohol services at the best of terms. Sorry, I've not really answered your question there, but I'm going to... No, no, (laughs) you have. I mean, it's, well, like you say, that there's no, there's no straightforward answer. And it's, and I guess it's about figuring out what might serve the people best and what, how we can be flexible. Yeah, and flexibility is the sort of the watchword and the cornerstone of providing care to this very vulnerable and marginalised group. Mm. I think it's it's something that you've you've talked about doing work on before, as in looking at the barriers or the challenges that people might have in accessing services. So I guess I wonder what you think about what kind of problems exist in offering treatment or providing treatment for people who have problematic substance use. Yeah, I mean, how long have you got? Um, <laughs> so, uh, so yes, there are there are a number of barriers, and I suppose we typically break them down in terms of barriers surrounding the individual and then barriers surrounding a, a more systemic or systems based approach. Mm-hmm. My work is largely focused on the latter. Mm-hmm. I think there's lots we can do to try and improve access uh, and, and reduce barriers in attendance. So I'll just give you a few examples but if we, if we look at the population of people experiencing rough sleeping mm-hmm. or who are homeless, obviously they have a huge amount of substance misuse comorbidity compared to the general population and they typically really really struggle to access services and all sorts of weird and wonderful barriers are put in place like some services will say you need identification or you need to prove that you live in the in the area in which the service that you're receiving care from or being served by, or, you know, you, uh, you need uh, various immigration documents or blah, 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 blah. Anyway, none of this is true. So we have very good explicit national guidance that says drug and alcohol services are akin to GP practices. So they provide what, what is legally termed primary medical care. And so any overseas visitor, irrespective of immigration status, irrespective of statuses like no recourse to public funds, can access drug and alcohol services. You do not need documentation to prove your address and services that are doing that can be reported to their local health watch and, and they're in breach of, the, of national guidance. Now, obviously, I understand that you know, what you don't want is someone that you don't know anything about starting prescribing for them or, or taking them on, but they shouldn't be barriers in terms of uh, getting people to access services, particularly people who are so ultimately disenfranchised and don't access services uh, at the best of times. If, we get, if you get them on the phone or you can get them through the door, we should be doing all we can in our power to engage these people in you know what's the appropriate support and trying to keep them there mm-hmm. when you talk about homelessness and the prevalence of these problems in people who are rough sleeping i guess the the project that you were involved in during the covid pandemic sounds incredible in the sense of so this was the the government initiative to to get everybody in so get people who were rough sleeping in into hotels or some kind of temporary housing and i guess there's there's a few aspects of this project that i'd love to find out about but I wonder what your experience was of getting people in, into some kind of accommodation and, and how that helped your work uh, in terms of providing care for them from, from a substance use perspective. Yeah, I mean, it was an amazing experience. <laughs> I, I think all, we all learned a lot. Mm-hmm. We did some things very well. We did some things terribly. It was a completely chaotic uh, setup process um, in the midst of lockdown and, you know, circulating infectious disease. And yeah, I, it's, it's, it's a part of my life I'll never forget, yeah, some, for, some for good reasons, some for bad. So, yeah, it, when, so when COVID hit and when lockdown was imposed, as you say, the, the government launched a policy initiative called Everyone In, which directed local government associations to provide emergency temporary housing to anyone who was experiencing rough sleeping within their area. So uh, I worked 
within London, um, and, and within London this was sort of coordinated by both the Greater London Authority, the GLA, and then the individual London borough councils. Mm -hmm. In London it took the form of yeah, pro procuring a, a large number of hotels, which at its peak housed about five and a half thousand people over the course of, uh, um, over the course of lockdown. And the hotels were, well, they, they varied in terms of the, the level of on-site provision of services, but the majority of the large ones were run by a homeless sector charitable organisation, and they were split into three different tiers. So there were hotels designated COVID care, which were looking after people who'd either tested positive for the virus or who had spent symptoms. Mm -hmm. COVID protect, which were for people who were asymptomatic or testing negative, but had medical vulnerabilities to, um, to become infected with COVID and then COVID prevent, which was everybody else. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine among this population, there was a huge amount of substance misuse comorbidity and suddenly a need to self-isolate, a reduction in access to both the substances that people were taking due to lockdown um, and a reduction in access to money. So sex work and begging, you know, didn't really exist at all. And so you suddenly had... A population that was teetering on the brink of withdrawal from a variety of substances and you were locking uh, not locking them but you were providing um accommodation for them which was really good you know it's that you know if we can solve homelessness during the pandemic gosh why can't we do it outside of that scenario um and so yeah as part of the response we uh, some funding was released and we formed what ultimately became known as hdas the homeless hotel drug and alcohol service and um, so we provided uh, yeah, a variety of different types of support to the population um, that were housed in the hotels and worked with the homeless sector charities to try and minimise as much substance-related harm as we could. And yeah, like I say, I think we did some really good things. I think we, you know, we, we tried our best. And yeah, so I, I, I can just tell you a little bit about what we did. But so we, we set up a 24-hour phone line initially mm -hmm. for everyone in the hotels to call us about substance misuse problems that was staffed by recovery workers and addiction psychiatrists really to deal with sort of any unplanned withdrawal how to manage that how to uh, how to sort people out and, and maybe get them into specialist local treatment services which was very busy in the in the uh, in the early uh, weeks and months of the pandemic uh, we also provided a whole bunch of stuff so harm reduction materials so we delivered naloxone which is the the antidote to opioid overdose um, lock boxes for people to safely store their, their buprenorphine or their methadone in clean needles and syringes, workbooks so that people could, while they were in their hotel rooms, work through some worksheets on the drug or alcohol that they were, they were using problematically, and a whole bunch of nicotine replacement resources. Mm -hmm. So both nicotine replacement gum, sprays, and about 4,000 electronic cigarettes to various people, because obviously people couldn't go out, couldn't access tobacco or, or nicotine in the way that they had previously and they didn't have any money uh, and they couldn't smoke in the hotel rooms and so they then became a much safer and you know, much needed intervention to try and keep people in their rooms particularly if they needed self-isolate because otherwise we'd have people congregating outside smoking sharing cigarette butts increasing their risk of both COVID infection but, but also all of the problems that are associated with tobacco smoking mm. so yeah we did that we had lots of people who went into unplanned alcohol withdrawal sort of across various um, across various hotels that we were trying to manage remotely. Uh, we became very friendly with a uh, large swathe of Uber Eats drivers who delivered lots of vodka mm. um, for it. And, and we ran a sort of virtual, what's termed a managed alcohol program. So providing alcohol to people with alcohol dependence to prevent unplanned withdrawal and reduce the risks of unplanned withdrawal and reduce the risks of seizures and uh, various other things that can happen, which worked reasonably well and tried to increase access to, to people to get into local treatment systems. Mm. So a lot of the people who were housed in the hotels had never previously engaged or necessarily wanted to engage with drug and alcohol treatment services, but we suddenly had a population that were housed in the other day, had a phone, we could contact them for the first time possibly in, in, in you know, a long term since they've been rough sleeping. And we, we, you know, we got over 150 people ultimately who not previously been in drug and alcohol treatment services into drug and alcohol treatment services. 
um, yeah, it was, we, we did some good stuff. We learned a lot of things along the way. So HDAS has just actually wrapped up. So it had its two year anniversary in April and a, and a service similar to it has just been commissioned to, to take over and work with people experiencing rough sleeping to try and uh, improve their outcomes and get them into drug and alcohol treatment services. Wow, that's incredible. Congratulations. Thank you. I guess to take back one step, so with, with alcohol, well, I guess with, 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 with all drugs, but with when people suddenly stop using the drugs or perhaps even have a period of using much less than they were before because the body builds up both a tolerance and a dependence on these drugs, there's a very physical, very physical symptoms that can happen. And with alcohol, those, like you said, can be particularly dangerous in the form that people can have seizures, which can be life-threatening, but on either, even if not life-threatening, are, are incredibly unpleasant and uncomfortable symptoms to have. So I guess that must have been really, really challenging to manage, like you say, when when su- access to supply was was different. I guess was it was it quite concerning or frightening for the hotel staff? How 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 did people want it end for the for the residents themselves? Yeah, I think it was. So I mean, to give you an idea of numbers, about fifty percent of the population going into the hotel was using alcohol harmfully, so it had some kind of negative negative impact on their mental or physical health we're talking quite uh, you know a lot of a lot of people Mm. and yes there there was there's there was a lot of fear among among staff working directly in the hotels for for a whole number of reasons obviously alcohol intoxication can produce disinhibition and people can become violent aggressive there were in the early days there were quite a lot of evictions or threatened evictions from the hotels the, the root cause of which was deemed to be alcohol. And we worked a lot with hoteliers and, and staff working in the hotels to try and minimise evictions and try and you know, reduce, reduce those kind of harms that were associated with alcohol. But a, the majority of staff working in there had never been trained or had very little experience in dealing with people with substance misuse issues. So we created a bespoke training programme that was delivered by, delivered by an external consultant that we hired. Um, and we trained a I can't remember the final numbers, but it's it's something like 60 or 70 um, members of staff within the hotels to give them a very sort of crash course first aid in, in substance misuse related issues. And yeah, exactly as you say, alcohol was was by far and away the thing that we got called about most and the thing that was most concerning to to both residents and or the, the unplanned withdrawal effects of which were most concerning to residents and to members of staff working there. And we decided pretty early on that it was going to be impossible for us to try and instigate appropriate clinically managed and overseen detoxification in sort of, you know, a bunch of 70 disparate hotels across the capital and trying to do this virtually. Uh, And so we decided that a managed alcohol program or provision of alcohol was going to be a more efficient use of resources. And so, yeah, we, we taught staff how to calculate someone's alcohol intake. And then we tried to match them unit for unit if they looked like they were going to go into unplanned withdrawal, be that because they needed to self-isolate or they were testing positive or they'd run out of money or you know, all of the various things that can happen uh, in terms of suddenly stopping your drinking. And that was met with a mixed response, I would say. So people often have, can have sort of quite strong moral objections to giving alcohol to people who are alcohol dependent or particularly purchasing alcohol for people who are alcohol dependent, um, which is, you know, is, is the safest thing to do. Suddenly stopping drinking is, is, as we've discussed, incredibly dangerous. But trying to sort of win over hearts and minds that this was appropriate, both clinically and in the situation that we were in, was tricky at times. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's been a lot of work done on managed alcohol programs across the globe, particularly in Canada to try and understand ways or use language to to explain the the, the potential benefits of this to both to you know residents but also to to professionals at provision of alcohol we think anecdotally you know we haven't we didn't formally study this but anecdotally it reduced evictions or threatened evictions it reduced unwanted behavior it reduced people just saying screw this I'm going to leave the hotel and go and drink which is obviously not what you want when there's a circulating deadly virus that particularly affects people with multiple comorbidities of which the population of people experiencing rough sleeping are typically higher in. So yeah, it was, it was tricky. And, and all of that 
uh, you know, around alcohol was true. And then if you say, can you let people consume class A drugs on site, please? They, um, <laughs> you know, that, their anxieties also increased. And I think one of the benefits of HDAS, the sort of soft benefits of HDAS, was that it meant that whenever public health or local government officials for London were having meetings or discussions around the hotels, it meant that substance misuse sort of had a voice at the table. Mm. It just meant that we could sit there and say, actually, have you thought about this? You know, we need to, we need to think about ways. So, so vaping is a really good example with that. A lot of the hotels mm. didn't necessarily allow vaping on site. And we said, you need to. Mm-hmm. You know, like you know, this is not going to work otherwise because it's, it's it's an individual business decision as to whether or not they allow vaping indoors, which you know people weren't going to be smoking. This was a way of keeping them in their room, um, and lots of people transitioned onto electronic cigarettes, and hopefully, will have stuck with those and also and reduced their tobacco smoking. So that sounds amazing from a harm reduction perspective that people had an option of using something else and and perhaps maybe contributed to some longer term change in in their behaviours? Yeah, hopefully. I mean, again, just to give people an idea of the numbers, so about 80% of the people before going into the hotels were smoking tobacco cigarettes. So it's, you know, it's by far the most commonly used substance among people who are experiencing rough sleeping. Mm -hmm. And it usually contributes to their morbidity and their mortality. People die significantly younger than they would have previously. And a a lot of it is due to respiratory illness or, um, or, you know, smoking well, illnesses that can be affected negatively by tobacco smoking. So switching to a cleaner form of nicotine was absolutely the right thing to do. We were very fortunate to, to be able to provide electronic cigarettes. And, and actually, you know, professionals and residents really welcomed the supply of electronic cigarettes, you know, with, without, you know, sort of with no strings attached. Mm-hmm. Um, so we trained people how to use them. Um, and uh, quite a lot of staff actually ended up using them as well, which is absolutely fine. You know, trying to reduce tobacco harm in across the population any way that we can was useful. Mm-hmm. And so, what is the service that's going to be taking over? I think you mentioned that that something similar on the back of HDAS is is going to be coming into place. Yeah. So there's a new service that's about to be run by Phoenix Futures, who are a um, a drug and alcohol treatment provider. They, um, they were involved with HDAS as well. So sorry, I should have said HDAS was a, a, a consortium based sort of project. So it was, so I was there from SLAM as the clinical lead, uh, but then the various other drug and alcohol treatment providers from uh, the third sector were also provided recovery workers or logistics support or clinical note keeping records, etc. So Change Where we Live, Turning Point, Phoenix Futures, We Are With You, the Westminster Drugs Project, and I'm going to forget other ones, but there were other ones. It was, it was a, you know, it was a consortium run project. And yes, yeah, subsequently, so Phoenix Futures are going to be running a, a London wide service to, to basically try and improve uh, access and improve drug and alcohol treatment outcomes for people experiencing rough sleeping by increasing and promoting links with the local treatment service. Hmm. You talked before about burnout in, in drug services. I mean, was this the kind of project that the way that you describe it sounds like it, it you know, it worked, there was a problem and, and it was created and it addressed the problem. Was it, was it quite a satisfying way to work or how, how did it go? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it solved a problem, but it solved the problem of putting lots of people into hotels uh, who were about to withdraw in the midst of a pandemic in London, which is a very specific problem. <laughs> So I don't know, in terms of longer, in terms of longer term sort of outcomes, I mean, you know, about 3,000 of the people who were housed in London have gone on to have more permanent or move on accommodation, which is incredible and amazing. About 1,000 of them have returned to the streets, and some of them are actually still in, living in hotels um, even to this day. So, I mean, it was an amazing programme. That being said, you know, there are still lots of homeless people on the streets of London. In fact, you know, as we know, unemployment increased massively during the pandemic. Various other things happened to, to increase the amount of people experiencing rough sleeping on the streets. Uh, so, you know, we've by no way fixed homelessness. And the, the government's commitment in their election manifesto was that they, they would end homelessness by the end of this parliament, which is 2024. And whilst everyone in was an incredible scheme in lots of ways, it has not permanently fixed homelessness by any stretch of the imagination and it remains a huge 
issue, both from a social and a healthcare perspective. So I think while projects like HDAS and, and projects that would, would sort of happened around everyone in are all really, really good, we need to learn, well, we, like I say, we did good stuff, we, we screwed up some stuff, we, we, you know, we were very much trying to find our feet. But w the lessons that need to be taken from that, I think, are really, really important. And there's been a number of reports published around everyone in, so we published our own sort of lessons learned report from HDAS. And I think, you know, we, we can take a lot from that, that the sector, the drug and alcohol sector in particular, really, really came together and worked collaboratively, which they don't often do because of the nature of competitive tendering of services. It's really nice to work in harmony and collaboration to try and improve outcomes. And I think, you know, that's a main lesson that we can take is that when we, it sounds like a platitude, doesn't it? But like, you know, when, when we work together, we can achieve great things. Um, but it was really true like at the time and I think you know that the sector really did unite um, various bits of project but obviously you know we've gone back to the new normal and competitive tendering remains the, the norm within drug and alcohol treatment services and I'm sure old animosities will rear their ugly heads and that's not a particularly good or sustainable way I can see of, of running treatment services. There's been lots of work conducted, most notably in Australia, by um, Professor Alison Ritter, looking at different sort of payment structures and options for um, commissioning drug and alcohol services. And the evidence behind the evidence of improved outcomes for competitive tendering is a bit meh. <laughs> so there's, there's no strong evidence that um, competitive tendering improves healthcare outcomes. And so, you know, you might argue that all of the additional administrative burden and costs associated with competitive tendering could be put to better use trying to deliver um, outcomes that you know would ultimately improve the lives of people with, with drug and alcohol problems. Mm. And I'm, I'm really interested in the specifically in the impact of the provision of housing and I mean to get 5,500 people I think you said into accommodation is is brilliant and my understanding is that there's been a fair amount of work to show that this kind of housing first approach has a really positive impact on well obviously on people's lives and uh, from a moral perspective it, it's logical and it makes sense but also on things like healthcare use and hospital admissions and health outcomes and like you say it's it's not a, it's not a panacea it's not the thing that answers everything but it's it's a really essential starting point and, and I wonder if how the how the everyone in experience reflected that or or countered that or problems that it identified with that kind of thinking yeah i think you're completely right there's been a huge amount of both research and practical evidence on, on housing first as a model um which is you know largely very very positive as you say it's not a panacea it might not necessarily work for everyone but it's a very good step that you know people who need a home get a home we we've, we did quite a lot of qualitative work with with residents in the hotels as well and there's been quite there's been three main reports published in collaboration with some of my colleagues from king's college london if anyone is interested in them and i can happily send you the link there are three publicly available reports that basically document people's experiences and perceptions of their time in the hotel a month after they're leaving the hotel and uh, nine months after being in hotels during everyone in and yeah, as you say, the, the picture is mixed. So people were very grateful for a safe place to be, particularly with, with COVID circulating. People were also very receptive to receiving a number of healthcare services and other services that they might not otherwise have received. But, you know, they're, 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 it wasn't a perfect system. It was constructed in the middle of the pandemic. People had real problems with the food, uh, which you can imagine if you're in hospital, it's one of the things that you know you always get complaints around them um, but some of the food you know wasn't necessarily culturally appropriate or, or there were other issues surrounding the food and there were a huge amount of issues with the move-on process people were very uncertain about when this was going to end were they going to be put back onto the streets what kind of accommodation might they might be available to them afterwards and that's obviously really understandable you know the people who experience homelessness typically don't have the best interaction with government services and so being told, you know, come into this hotel, it's free, we'll house you. Of course, a lot of people were very uncertain and very dubious about that. That, that makes perfect sense, given the systems and the experiences that they've had previously. And whilst some people had a very, very positive experience in the hotels, some people didn't. And I think we need to acknowledge that and, mm. you know, understand that just by giving someone a house doesn't fix underlying trauma, drug and alcohol issues, mental health issues, you know, life, other social problems, but it's a bloody good start. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, I, one thing that I have wondered, and I'm, I'm hoping to pick your brains on, I guess, as a, as a junior psychiatrist, is the way that we treat other problems in people who have who have problematic substance use, specifically, I guess, in the, in terms of treating other psychiatric illnesses, but I'm sure social social problems like housing are are an issue as well. But everyone kind of fixates on on the depend on the on the drug problem as as the key problem, and sort of being told antidepressants don't work, psychotherapy won't be offered until the problem with the drug goes away. I, I guess I wonder how prevalent you find that attitude as an addiction psychiatrist, or, or what your approach to thinking about multiple problems, multiple health problems, in people is. It's incredibly prevalent. It's incredibly damaging. And it should be challenged at every single opportunity that you can challenge it. And I would make a plea to all of my mental health colleagues. I would make a plea to all my physical health colleagues. I would make a plea to the rest of humanity. Drug and, drug and alcohol misuse is never a reason to deny people access to other services. In fact, it is a reason almost certainly that these people are more risky or more in need of healthcare and treatment than perhaps they would be otherwise. So the, the, the strong message from what was Public Health England and what is now the Office of Health Improvement and Disparities is that there should be no wrong door, um, you know, that, that for people who come into an addiction service who have mental health problems, they should be able to access treatment for those either, either in-house or, or be supported to access services to which they need help from. And the same is true for mental health services. You're right, I I often get rejected referrals saying this person needs to be abstinent for six months before we'll see them. That is total nonsense. That is not in any of the national guidance. And I have have quoted nice guidance at at various people and organisations over my time. People with drug and alcohol problems can engage in psychotherapy. People with drug and alcohol problems can receive adequate treatment and support for social and other mental health issues. And indeed, they, they should. You should treat these things in parallel. As, as Dame Carol Black sort of really eloquently puts it whenever she speaks, if I had breast cancer uh, and went to a breast cancer surgeon, they would never say, you know, oh, well, we can't possibly see you until we've treated your hypertension and got your blood pressure under control. Please go away and, you know, get your blood pressure sorted and then come back and see us. That would never happen. And yet constantly for people who have drug or alcohol harmful use or dependence, they are told to try and quote unquote fix that before they can access any other kind of healthcare. It is nonsense um, and it should be completely challenged if ever you come up against it. I mean, it's, yeah, it's very, very helpful to hear you say that because it it, it absolutely comes comes up very frequently. Do you feel like it is something that is improving or, or how might it be improved? I guess, on a, on a societal or on a uh, national service level? No, I don't think it is. In fact, okay. I think if anything, it's getting worse. And I think partially that's driven by, by what we were talking about before. So the fragmentation of services, there's a large mentality of it's not coming out of my budget or, you know, this is not necessarily my problem to deal with. I'm not commissioned to deal with these, these or my service is not commissioned to deal with those issues. And I get it. Like, you know, there are, there are budgetary constraints. There are people feel less competent or confident about it. I think my main message would just be, just think of the person sat in front of you and think of the patient who has the difficulties that they have if you are actively denying them treatment, they're not going to get better. <laughs> That's sort of how it works, you know? Um, and so when, if you're sat in meetings or referral meetings or making a referral yourself, really just remember the person at the heart of it all. Because if you're saying, no, I'm rejecting this referral or I'm not letting them through the door on the basis that they're drinking alcohol on the basis that they're using substances, you are, you know, you're you're reinforcing a narrative for this person of rejection. You are not letting them access evidence-based treatment for highly stigmatized, normally reasons and not necessarily evidence-based ones. Mm. And so just really, really remember that person in your mind is, is, is at the core of this. We're trying to improve their lives. We're trying to improve their health. That's, that's the nature of the business that we're in. And by rejecting referrals on what are often quite spurious grounds, we're not doing anyone any favours. And I guess the point of, of being a healthcare professional or clinician in any description is our, our training should be or, or is such that 
we can deal with complex problems for for that person. So I guess perhaps at, at medical school, we get used to just being taught about one health problem in isolation. But the reality is that no, that that's just almost never the case that in A&E you'll meet someone who only has one little problem that you can fix and send them on their way. Exactly. So I guess changing our attitudes in some way to expect that we are dealing with a whole host of different issues should be the norm. Yeah, I completely agree. That might be a nice place to bring us towards a close. But I guess before I do, I wonder if, if there's anything that I've not asked you about or or anything that you were hoping to mention that, that, that we could talk about as well. No, I suppose just a, a plea in some ways that addiction services are are on their knees at the moment in England. And I just, yeah, I, I try and take every opportunity I can to, when speaking to a wider sort of mental health audience, to just remember your addiction colleagues who have had it rough for the last decade or so and can often themselves feel quite isolated and out of the more wider healthcare system or out of the more wider mental health care provision. Um, and so look out for your colleagues. They are stretched. There is a high amount of burnout within the professions around drug and alcohol use. And, you know, buy them a cup of tea if you see them. I guess on, on the back of you saying that, my almost startling experience of whenever I've co-worked with, uh, with these kind of tertiary sector services is how open and flexible they have been in you know we'll I, I guess we, we we do demand a lot of them you know might be saying okay we're suddenly discharging this person from the ward tomorrow can you see them and more often than not the answer is yes and they should come here and we'll call them and you know and if they don't come we'll find them and we'll try and look for them and yeah the the work and the approach that these services have actually is is often really refreshing and really really kind compassionate and patient focused yeah and and there is a huge amount of compassion within the sector and i think that's you know the reason that many of us get into this line of work and i you know i've met some deeply incredible inspiring people who despite all the system problems have you know provided excellent care and also people get better like outcomes from drug and alcohol harmful use and dependence are quite good if you have, um, you know, if you are able to access treatment and support, people really do get better. And so encouraging them to get into treatment uh, and encouraging professionals who work in the sector is really important. Thank you so much. That's a, that's a brilliant place to stop. Thank you so, so much for coming onto the podcast today, Emma. It's a real pleasure to have you and thank you for everything you've shared. Not at all. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. I really hope that you enjoyed as ever, please do let us know what you thought, either on Twitter or Instagram or sending us an email. If issues around substance use or substance use disorders is something that you're interested in, do check out some of our previous episodes that talk about this in relation to cannabis, both with Dr. Amir England and Professor Sir Robin Murray and Dr. Marta DeForti, or with regards to alcohol with Dr. Richard Miller. We've also got some more episodes on substance use disorders coming up very soon, so have a look out for those. Thanks again. You are listening to a multi-learning podcast.